the last time we looked at uh, the notion of uh, unitary equivalence, we completed that discussion. And then we presented uh, or discussed this very important theorem, which is Schur's unitary triangularization theorem, which basically says that given any matrix, there's no restrictions on A, it can be any complex valued matrix of size N cross N, and it, can ha it has eigenvalues lambda 1 to lambda N, and N cross N matrix will always have N eigenvalues. Then there exists a unitary matrix U such that A is unitarily equivalent to a, a, a matrix T, which is upper triangular with diagonal entries equal to these N eigenvalues, lambda 1 to lambda N. Of course, if this, uh, if A and all its eigenvalues are real, U can, can be chosen to be a real orthogonal matrix, which will also be real orthonormal matrix. Okay, so that's the, I mean, the generality of the theorem is what makes it very important. It's apply, applicable under no restrictions on the matrix A. One application of this triangularization theorem that we saw was the Cayley Hamilton theorem, which basically says that any matrix A satisfies its own characteristic polynomial. Um, and uh, we saw the proof of this theorem, and that's where we stopped the previous time. Uh, the next thing to today, what I want to discuss is uh, some uses of the Cayley Hamilton theorem and then uh, some points about diagonalizability of matrices. And then I'll uh, maybe start the discussion on normal matrices. OK, so we'll begin with the first point that is the uses of Cayley Hamilton theorem. So the Cayley Hamilton theorem can be used to express uh, a power k for k greater than or equal to n as a linear combination of lower powers of a. So this is an application that I'm, I'm, uh, I suppose most of you have seen in your undergraduate program. So we can write a power k, k greater than or equal to n as a linear combination of i a a power n minus one. So we'll just <coughs> illustrate this with an example. So suppose a was the matrix three, one, minus two and zero then its characteristic polynomial p a of t will be t minus 3 times t plus 2 so that's going to be equal to t squared minus 3 t plus 2 and since the matrix a satisfies its characteristic polynomial we have a squared minus 3 a plus 2 i equals the all zero two cross two matrix which in turn implies a squared equals 3a minus 2i so i can write a squared in terms of a and the identity matrix now a cube i just have to multiply this by a i get 3a squared minus 2a and i can substitute for a squared from this so that becomes I'll just do it 3 times 3a minus 2i minus 2a, which is equal to 9a minus 6i minus 2a, which is equal to 7i minus 6, sorry, 7a minus 6i. Similarly, a power 4, again you multiply this by a and then you substitute for a squared and um, you get uh, 7a squared minus 6a which then is equal to 15a minus 14i and so on. So we can write all the higher powers of a as a linear combination of uh, lower powers of A. 
again this is a very interesting observation and uh, to me it is not obvious why if you take higher and higher powers of a uh, you should always be able to write it as a linear combination of uh, the first n powers including zero of a specifically if you take an n cross n matrix it's an object that that is living in n squared dimensional space um, and so I can always write an n squared dimensional vector as a linear combination of n squared linearly independent vectors all sitting in the n, n squared dimensional space. So, so the fact that you can, I mean, so if, if I had said that I can write a power n as a linear combination of n squared matrices, i a a squared up to a to the n squared minus one, that would not have been surprising. But what is surprising here is that you can write a power k as a linear combination of i a a squared up to a power n minus one only. So you only need n of these matrices and all other powers of a can be written as linear combination of these n matrices. That's what is surprising here. Now, um, so, so basically, uh, one other small thing is that this constant term here is actually a determinant of A, and uh, that is not equal to zero. So A is non-singular. So A is non-singular. So this allows us actually to write uh, or find A inverse like this. So basically what I do is I take this equation and write 2i is equal to 3a minus a square or i is equal to 3 over 2 or I'll write it this way. I'll take 1a common out between these two and write it as a times 3i minus a over 2. Now I multiply both sides by a inverse and that gives me a inverse is equal to 3i minus a over 2. So which I can write as 3i is 3 over 2, 0, 0, 3 over 2, minus a over 2 is 3 over 2, 1 over 2, minus 1, 0. <coughs> <coughs> so then that gives me a inverse is equal to 0 minus half 1 and 3 over 2. So basically Kelly-Hamilton theorem allows you to also compute A inverse when A is non-singular. And uh, in fact, you can find expressions for A to the minus two, A to the minus three and so on also. So you can try this. So all you have to do is to multiply this by uh, A inverse and then substitute for A inverse from this. So you'll get three over two times A inverse minus one half the identity matrix, but you already have an expression for A inverse. You substitute for that, you'll get an expression for A to the minus two and so on. And this, this observation is true for any non-singular matrix. And so we can say that for any non-singular a in c to the n cross n, there exists a polynomial q of t of degree at most 
n minus 1 such that a inverse equals q of a. Okay, so now we move on to the next point, which is that um, we know that not all matrices are, are diagonalizable, but how close can we get? Can we get a matrix that is, uh, can we take a matrix that is not diagonalizable and express it uh, through a similarity transform um, or a unitary equivalence to a matrix which is almost diagonal? So there are two ways to answer this. So the first way is to consider that is we can say that can we find or so okay I'll just write the answer. So there exists a diagonalizable matrix. that is arbitrarily close to the given matrix. And I'll make the sense in which I'm saying arbitrarily close clear in a minute. And B, any given matrix is similar to an upper triangular matrix. with uh, arbitrarily small of diagonal entries. That is, it's almost diagonalized. Okay, so uh, basically, this is, uh, I mean, there are two theorems that it, Make, basically make this assertion. So the first one is like this. So we're given a matrix A in C to the N cross N. Given any small number epsilon greater than zero, there exists an A of epsilon, which is a matrix that's going to be close to A in C to the N cross N. that has n distinct eigenvalues and therefore diagonalizable. And is such that sigma i j equal to 1 to n a i j minus a i j of epsilon. This is the difference between corresponding entries of a and a of epsilon and added up square values added up over all the entries is less than epsilon. Okay, so here a i j of epsilon is the i j th element of a of epsilon. Okay, so this is the result. So basically, it doesn't matter if a matrix is not diagonalizable, you can find a matrix that is arbitrarily close to it and is also diagonalizable. So proof is actually quite straightforward. 
So since A is N cross N, there is a U such that U Hermitian AU is equal to T, which is upper triangular. That is Shor's theorem. Let E be a matrix, a diagonal matrix. E N with E I in magnitude being less than square root of epsilon over N. Okay. So E I is each of them. Uh, none of them is bigger than square root of epsilon over n in magnitude. And we choose these EIs such that T11 plus E1, T22 plus E2, T n n plus E n are distinct. Okay, so can this be done? Can you always find E1, E2 up to E n with magnitudes less than square root of n such that T11 plus E1, T22 plus E2, etc. up to T n n plus E n are distinct numbers? Of course you can, because there are infinitely many numbers between 0 and uh, square root of epsilon over n. You just have to pick some numbers such that, and you also can choose the phase, ang phase angles of these numbers uh, to make them all distinct. So it's, not, it's really very easy to choose n numbers such that T11 plus E1 up to Tnn plus En are all distinct numbers. Then... <clears throat> The matrix T plus E <coughs> has distinct eigenvalues which means that it is diagonalizable. So we've already seen that before, that a matrix that has distinct eigenvalues is always diagonalizable. And, uh, and so basically we, we then have that if I consider U times T plus E times U Hermitian, so I'm undoing this operation here, this will be equal to A plus U E U Hermitian Okay, this matrix, this is a similarity transform, it preserves the eigenvalues. So this matrix has distinct eigenvalues. Which implies it is diagonalizable. Okay, so and yeah, so and it is similar to T plus E. So that tells us what we should choose as A of epsilon. So let A of epsilon be equal to A plus U E U Hermitian, which implies A minus A of epsilon is going to be minus U E U Hermitian. So and we have already seen that A of epsilon is diagonalizable. We just need to show that the Frobenius norm of A minus A of epsilon, the Frobenius norm squared of this is going to be less than epsilon. That will satisfy this last requirement of the theorem. So then we have that summation i j equal to 1 to n mod a i j minus a i j of epsilon square. This is the Frobenius norm and this is invariant under unitary equivalence and so or in fact it's invariant under similarity transforms 
and so this is equal to sigma i equal to 1 to n, I just need to consider the Frobenius norm of this quantity E, which is diagonal, so I just need to add up over the diagonal entries mod E i square, but each of these E i's is at most square root of epsilon over n in magnitude, so E i squared is at most epsilon over n, and so if I add up n of these, I get that this is less than n times epsilon over n, which is equal to epsilon. So basically, therefore, A of epsilon satisfies the requirements of the theorem. The other theorem is it goes like this. So again, A is an n cross n matrix. Then for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a non-singular S epsilon belonging to C to the n cross n. such that S epsilon inverse A S epsilon is equal to T epsilon, which is upper triangular and mod of T i j of epsilon is less than epsilon or one less than or equal to i less than j less than or equal to epsilon. Of course, tii you cannot restrict it to be small because tiis are the eigenvalues of a, and so those need no, those may not be small, but the off diagonal terms can be made arbitrarily small. So the difference between the two theorems is that in this case, what we are doing is instead of trying to diagonalize A, we are trying to diagonalize a nearby matrix A epsilon. And we say that and there is a near, nearby matrix A, A epsilon that is diagonalizable. And in this theorem, what we are trying to do is um, we are in, instead of bringing A to uh, a diagonal form, we are bringing it to an upper triangular form with arbitrarily small off diagonal entries. So we are getting it closer and closer to being so I won't go over the proof of this theorem. It's, um, uh, uh, it's a, some detail which will take me a, while, a long time to complete, but you can see the text. And uh, in order to just, uh, there's the last point in this particular discussion. There is uh, one more theorem, which is actually another extension of Schuh's theorem and is useful for the Jordan canonical form, which we'll discuss a bit later. So this is, uh, so again, A is an N cross N matrix. Then, uh, and it has distinct eigenvalues. Lambda one through lambda k, it has k distinct eigenvalues, which and k could be less than n, k can at most be equal to n, with algebraic multiplicities. So algebraic multiplicity is the number of times it occurs as a zero of the characteristic polynomial. n1 through nk respectively. Thank you.
then a is similar to the matrix t1 tk zero everywhere else where these matrices ti is upper triangular ni cross ni upper triangular with diagonal entries lambda i. So this theorem again, I won't show the proof here. Um, but the proof, uh, it basically first involves using Shor's theorem to get an upper triangular form and then using a series of carefully chosen uh, non-unitary similarity transforms that produce the this kind of an upper uh, block upper triangular form um, and uh, and the, especially the zeros in the off diagonal terms uh, without changing the diagonal or the upper triangular structure of the matrix T. But this is going to be we'll used this later when we discuss the Jordan canonical form. OK, so next we'll discuss about normal matrices. So this matrix is the diagonal, right? Which T1 matrix? T1 to TK, this matrix, similar matrix to A. This would be diagonal, right? Because uh -huh. T. Uh, this is upper triangle. Up It's upper triangular. So again, uh, keep in mind that this is a result which applies to any A which is of size N cross N. So A need not be diagonalizable for this result to hold. If, uh, I mean, it, it is possible that T, you, you can, you will end up with uh, TIs all being diagonal, which is possible if A is uh, diagonalizable. But if A is not diagonalizable, but it has these distinct eigenvalues, lambda one to lambda K, then A, is similar to an upper triangle, uh, this kind of a block upper triangular matrix, uh, a concatenation of uh, upper triangular matrices uh, along the diagonal, where each Ti is upper triangular with diagonal entries equal to the corresponding eigenvalue lambda i. Uh, 